Hello, my name is John Reynolds. On this episode of Extraordinary Life Stories, I'm talking with Professor Dan Nicolau. Dan is a mathematician, medical doctor, physician, and engineer. He has six university degrees. He deliberately set out to educate himself and learn as much as possible about the natural world. I want to know why. We have not made much progress on curing cancer at all in the last century. And that's because we keep on trying to kill the cancers. Dan's work focuses on trying to diffuse it, like we do with organized crime. I've never heard of cancer being compared to the mafia. His groundbreaking work focuses on cancer is not your enemy. Hey, that's quite a statement, considering half of us will get cancer and a third will die of it, and he knows this. It's literally the why behind all his efforts to find a cure to prevent these very stats. Dan flew back from Harvard yesterday to film this interview with me where his groundbreaking clinical trials are taking place. Let's get into it. I'm really looking forward to talking with Dan. Dan, welcome. Thanks for having me. Cool. Tell me, who is Professor Dan Nicola? So Dan to my friends, um, I think like everybody else, a work in progress, mm. um, an evolving, uh, an evolving person, basically. Yeah. Yeah, with stages and, yeah. and setbacks and stuff. It's a very humble way of answering that <laughs> it's, it's let, me, let me take you back to a young Dan growing up. What did you want to be when you were aspiring to grow up? So my parents are scientists, both of them, mm. um, chemists. And um, so I grew up with loads of science. Mm. Um, and I don't really remember a time that I didn't want to be either a scientist or, or a doctor or, or an engineer. I ended up becoming all three um, through restlessness, essentially. But um, but yeah, a lot of it is family influence. I think when I was little, it was something like be an astronaut, you know, um, like a lot of kids. And then um, and then that sort of evolved into mathematics, basically. Um, and that evolved into engineering. And then that sort of evolved into like whether the human body is sort of an engineering system. And that evolved into clinical medicine. Um, and now there's a kind of a combination of those things in my research career. Um, yeah. Broadly. But having all that education in that space and then joining dots in that space makes you pretty formidable you know, in terms of what you do now. Yes, yeah, so I think people used to do it um, in the Renaissance. You know, we talk about Renaissance, mm. um, Renaissance man or Renaissance person. Um, it was possible because there was less knowledge to be had. Yeah. So you could be, you know, um, uh, you know, a person of state and a scientist and a, you know, physician. Um, it became harder because we got so much knowledge and it became very self-specialized. So although it seems like what I've done, you know, sixth degree, I mean, it sounds crazy, but there's a little bit of method to the madness, just a little. Um, and it's, it's about could you recreate a Renaissance um, person in in the 21st century? Because yeah. we do have a lot more tools at our disposal for learning. Sure. So the answer, I think, you know, I can say now after 20 years is yes. You can be an engineer, a doctor, and a mathematician. Um, it's a lot of a lot of focused, intense study, yeah. basically, but not requiring any special skills. Just just intense you got, study. You got six degrees. Yeah, and also I love the fact you you researched nature extensively, didn't you? And what was the why behind that? Yeah, that's a good question. I, the ancients used to think about. Um, when it comes to the body, for example, as being integrative, so you know, theory of humors and, and stuff that things have to be in balance. Um, we kind of lost that in the Enlightenment. We started thinking about how to take things apart mm -hmm. as though something like as though God was an engineer. So now we take flowers apart, we take cells apart, we take you know, the brain apart, try to break everything down into its constituent parts, the reductionist approach, in the hope that we can then put everything back together. But I was going through my undergraduate years and I didn't really feel that. I felt like something was kind of lost and that we, we are somehow more than the sum of the parts. So I wanted sure. to do, I wanted to have a career that integrated everything together in the hope um, and belief that at some point in the 21st century, we will once again begin to think about the body and therefore disease and health as, um, as, a, as a whole, as, in, as an integrative um, effort, basically. Yeah, I yeah. get that. And the, the conversation we've had prior to filming that I particularly enjoyed, particularly because of someone of your level of intellect, you don't use complicated jargon. You <laughs> seem to know that whether it's talking to me or anyone that, that you're trying to relay what you're doing, you, you talk in layman's terms, you talk in, in almost visualization. And of course, this understanding of nature and understanding what potentially hasn't worked before 
you know, and I'm going to use the term that you've used to me, cancer is not your enemy. That is quite, that would shock quite a few people. It, it kills so many people. You'll have all the stats. Talk to me about how the, the sort of journey you've come from and, the, the, and how you've come into this to then be able to reframe that mm. and what you're actually doing. Yeah, well, thank, thanks for the question. Um, it partially came out of, um, after my my PhD, which was which is here at Oxford, I went to UC Berkeley, mm. um, and I worked in the lab of a of a great um, lady called Mimi Cole, who, amongst other many other accomplishments, was studying the emergence of multicellularity. So we mm. start, you know, obviously life used to be unicellular. At some point, we became multicellular. Yeah. Things like jellyfish, and then developed into, you know, what we are: whales, elephants, right? Yeah. The cost of that is cancer, right? Because you can't have cancer as a single-celled organism. So when you become a community, you can get things like organized crime, for example, within the community. We've never really thought about cancer that way, but my thought when I was at Berkeley and studying this stuff is, you know, if cancer is really, it's not a foreign invader, they are our cells. They sure. are as close to us as, it's more like a family feud, you know, mm -hmm. partially why we have so much trouble treating it because the cells are almost identical to the normal cells, right? If you think about how you treat disease, usually it's because of the difference between, say, bacteria and us, that's how you use antibiotics. Mm -hmm. In cancer, that doesn't really work because there are cells, so we do things like chemotherapy, which is like carpet bombing. Essentially, you, you, you hope to kill the tumor before you kill the, the patient. And we haven't really made a lot of progress on that. And I think it's because we're using the wrong metaphor. We think of it as a foreign enemy or a foreign invader. Yeah. But it's, it's part of us. It's more like a, like a family feud that blows up out of control. Yeah. Or like a little tiny gang of pretty benign, you know, kids doing graffiti in the McDonald's parking lot that turns into like a civil war. I was going to say, because ultimately anyone watching or listening to this would be like, you know, if you sort of relate it to a little gang, it's doing a lot of damage. It's taking a lot of lives. It's, they're very effective little gangs. So using that same language and metaphor, how are, you, how are you working from a preventative point of view and a cure point of view to actually sort the gang out? Yeah. Another great question. So I think if you think about how organized crime takes hold in society, it's because people don't have welfare, don't have mm. safety, don't have jobs, don't have running water, right? And the way that societies that are successful at fighting organized crime fight it, um, it's not usually that much through policing or punitive measures in jail. What eventually brings the gangs down is welfare, safety, jobs, a meaningful, purposeful life yeah. that the state can uh, and society can help to provide. So the counterpart to that in cancer therapy would be, I mean, there are a lot of things, but for example, something that we're working on at the moment is um, is a is a grant to implant little chips inside tumors and see if they have electrical activity kind of like a little brain yeah what we've been calling protocognition so as the cancer grows it probably has a basic form of cognition not mm -hmm. like we have but trying to represent its world our interior and trying to survive it doesn't want to kill you because it dies with you so in that respect it's not an enemy so one thing we can do is just try to listen to the signals it's sending internally, see if it has like a very basic language, see if we can kind of talk back a little bit. I mean, that's kind of sci-fi stuff. Sure. Um, that's one thing. Something else that we learned in the pandemic, for example, from COVID is that a lot of the, the damage that it does and a lot of the deaths that it causes are through the immune system over responding. And if you use things that calm down the immune system paradoxically, mm -hmm you may be able to prevent most COVID hospitalizations or death simply by just chilling out, if I can use that expression, yeah. the immune system. Um, so the hope is that that will work with cancer as well, Absolutely. and indeed many other diseases. Yeah, so actually through a, obviously a very difficult situation, the pandemic, some of the learnings from that are, are actually you know, helping everything you're doing into the, the cancer side of things. Oh yes, we learned an enormous amount. That's interesting. Uh, immunology learned an enormous yeah. amount about, the, you know, very unfortunate circumstances, of course, but we learned, um, you know, we probably did 20 years of immunology in, in a couple of years of, in the pandemic. Yeah. Um, and we are beginning to see things differently now, um, including this interaction between, for example, the brain and the immune system. Yes. Um, people with a positive mindset do better at infections, do better at cancer, and, and conversely, the immune response affects the brain. So yes. we're now beginning to really kind of get to understanding that interaction. Um, and, and it has to be the future because, um, because we know that, that the mind and the body affect each other deeply, profoundly. Yes. Um, There's a lot more being talked about, which is, which is a good thing. I'd love to relate that to you, actually. You know, uh, you know, all the Harvard, you've kindly flown from Harvard yesterday to come back and film with me you know, today. There's, there's you know, the time, the effort, the juggling that goes with that. What do you do with all that you know and understand to do with mindset and to do with the physical health side of things? What do you do to keep yourself both mentally fit and physically fit? 
Yeah, <laughs> um, it's hard after a flight. Um, yeah. So, I mean, honestly, a lot of is I just get um, a huge amount of um, excitement and energy from um, interacting with my students, um, past and and present. Yeah. And in some respects, if someone were to ask me what I look forward to, you know, after I get off my jet lag. Um, well, I have some medical students, they're a delight. I'm going to probably teach them a little bit next week. Um, some of my past students are doing very well now. Um, so a lot of it is just about, um, I'm lucky enough that in, in my work, I, I get a lot of, I get to interact with really amazing people, yeah. most of them very modest, most of them unsung heroes. Yes. Um, so that helps a lot. Um, and then the rest of it, I mean, I'm interested to hear what you do, but, you know, a little bit of meditation, like, jogging you know nothing yeah nothing out of the ordinary just the usual, right. <laughs> the usual stuff you know get some sleep <laughs> yeah sure and what about diet yeah um one thing i would say that hasn't been appreciated enough maybe until recently is the importance of um the the gut um and yeah. the lung which also has a biome um on uh, homeostasis basically which mm -hmm. is how the body keeps you centered um so taking care of the the intestinal mm. um, flora. I think if you ask most people what percentage of the immune system was in the stomach, I mean, the stomach is like, what, 5% of you or something? Yeah. Um, or in the intestine, you know, it's 10%. Um, how much of the immune system is there? It's like 75 or 80%. Yeah. So mm, the vast, the great majority of our immunity is connected for reasons that we don't understand to um, our gut yeah. and some of it to our lung. So taking care of, um, taking care of the community down there. Uh, yeah. As you age, that community is under assault from various, you know, bad food, stress, you know, sure. um, life. So it's important to protect that. And you can, you can do things, you can drink kefir. You know, I, was gonna, I was gonna ask you for an yeah. example, like maybe is there a certain um, kind of supplement or part of your diet that you really prioritize for that very reason? I religiously drink kefir okay. um, and I grew up in Romania, it's in the culture. Yeah. Uh, we just, not because it's good for your gut biome, it's just, um, so drinking milk is just something that, that we mm. do and other cultures have other ways. Um, so I don't think it matters exactly how you do it, but yeah, um, yeah, kefir and, um, you know, just make sure that you, um, basically the food that we eat is in the West is pretty, pretty terrible. Um, we know it causes a lot of inflammation and inflammation is almost by definition a disease state. I mean, yep. it's not just an academic um, thing that we measure in the lab. Inflammation is almost exactly what you mean when you say you aren't feeling well. Yeah. And so we know after like low quality food, you get the inflammatory spikes. Um, if you don't sleep enough because you're looking at social media late at night, you get inflammatory yeah. um, signals up. Um, so basically, to some extent, reducing inflammation is really the goal. Yes. Um, it seems now in 2023 yes. that, that that's what we'll, we'll learn over the next 10, 20 years, that just reducing inflammation. Animals that have very low inflammation live um, far longer than their counterparts that aren't as good at fighting inflammation. That's interesting. Yeah, there are some rats in Kenya who live, you know, they never, none of them get cancer ever. They don't get Alzheimer's, they don't get heart disease. They're called the naked mole rat. And it seems like what they're doing is they're just really good at not getting inflamed. Yeah. <laughs> and they, they live like 10 or 20 times longer than their nature. Yeah, nature's got waste of, nature's yeah. been at this for three and a half billion years. We're, we're just- Why the naked mole rat? But yeah. I yeah. don't know why it's got to be the naked mole rat, but um, yeah. yeah. Nature's been at this for three and a half billion years, so it's, um, going to be like a thousand times smarter than us. Yeah. So we should just be learning from nature. Totally. Right? You mentioned inflammation. We're really interested to know how much of that is, is affected physically and whether it can actually be affected mentally. It could absolutely be affected mentally. Um, there are some classic experiments, not even recent from the 70s, where mm -hmm. you can behaviorally condition it in rats. For example, you give them um, an immune suppressant and sugar water. Then you take away the immune suppressant, you give them sugar water, mm -hmm. they get inflammation. Some of the animals die. Um, if you get, there's an experiment where they got actors to act sad scenes and happy scenes from Shakespeare and the ones who acted the sad scenes were immune suppressed afterwards and less able to fight infections. Really it's not really even real sadness because it's an act. Yeah. Yeah. So the irony. Jeez. Yeah, ironically, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I mean, there's a lot of evidence now emerging around this stuff, really fascinating stuff, some of it that we are working on, um, but it's a big effort. Um, so inflammation can be caused um, by the brain and can be also tapered down by the brain. There's evidence that social media causes inflammatory markers to go up. Um, we're not really sure how, possibly by interfering with self-esteem or other things. Um, and there's also evidence in the other direction that if you have a high level of inflammation, you seek out social media. 
um, which will probably make your inflammation worse. It's probably a vicious cycle. Yeah. So, and in respect of the care of children, that's clearly something that legislatively and policy-wise needs to be thought about as this evidence continues to emerge. Yeah. Um, you know. So, yeah, yeah. No, but to to answer your question as succinctly as I know how, absolutely, your brain can control your inflammatory state, and your inflammatory yeah. state affects your brain and your mind, and the two have been in this dance for hundreds of millions of years trying to keep you safe. So yes, absolutely, absolutely. But social media has not been there. No. And so we're all consumed by it now. It's not going away. And yeah. So as a, as a parent of two daughters, you've got your son, how are we going to manage that? That's, that's not a fair question to professors. It's more of a joint question, but that's no, something we really to, need to be aware of. I'm keen to hear your thoughts, but what I can say is that in the eight, late eight, uh, 1800s, this debate was being had about privacy. It wasn't recognized as a human right or as a legislative right. It wasn't recognized as any kind of right. Mm. And the newspapers were really, really violating upon the family circle uh, and privacy of the individual. And um, a couple of, at Harvard actually, a couple of, couple of guys um, yeah. published what is now a very famous um, article in the Harvard Law Review called The Right to Privacy, arguing that um, violating upon privacy is causing harm and that privacy is a human right or it's a right in tort law. Or, or a statutory right, and it needs to be protected under law, we would now not conceive of living in a community or a society that doesn't protect the right to privacy. It's the United Nations um, Article 12. It's in the Constitution of this country. It's in the Constitution of the United States and basically anywhere that we would live. Um, and yet we have nothing for attention, even though social media is assaulting it all the time. And I think it's, you know, if you think about what will seem barbaric in a couple of decades, it probably will be that it's taken us so long to that get extreme. to protecting it as a as a right, as a legal right, potentially a human right. God, the challenge with that, and you you, you actually asked me that, is yeah. you know, as a parent that will go on social media, so your kids see that, and I know how addictive it can be. The, the for you page on Instagram, it's got all the things you love, and you click one more, one more, one more. So actually, there's a hypocrisy in probably all the families around the world where you know, you've got your kids consumed by it, it's clearly bad for them, and then we're doing it well. It's, it, we're doing it as well. That's, it's now become a, a habit, it's become a culture. Maybe one way for you to think about it as a parent is smoking. So we, we know smoking is bad for you, we know it causes lung cancer. Right? Sure. We've known that for a really long time. So we do let people smoke, but we try to regulate it, we don't let children smoke. Um, and That's it took a long time for society to kind of go, hey, you know what, actually, Clearly, it's causing lung cancer and heart problems and loads of other things. And but but eventually, the law did did catch up and yeah. continues to continues to evolve. So never thought of relating, but that's that's why that. I love the way your brain works. You have this <laughs> whole way of relating it and, and reframing it. But that's that's pretty controversial because actually, I know that um, friends around us, that the, the sort of generation ahead of you, like if you like that, you know, when Facebook. Instagram was coming out and they were letting their kids have it. They were doing a, a camp for their dog and then those kids got really heavily bullied because mm. of all the, you know, the kind of cyberbullying, if you like, and lessons were learned. But that's a different way of what we're talking about to actually the whole inflammation. It's, it's actually causing physical problems. That's a whole different thing because that I mean, is more of a societal yeah. thing. I, I th oh, I see what you mean, yes. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So Th the, there is a distinction, yes, of course. Yeah. Right. I mean, of course, people were saying it can't be good for your brain and so on, but then there were people saying, yeah, but people said you shouldn't watch too much TV. Yeah. People said you shouldn't, and so, but this is, this is actually... I, I mean, smoking causes know. inflammation, drugs cause inflammation, like, sure. lo lo you know, life causes essentially inflammation, yeah. but, but when it comes to social media, if you can show, and it, it is still being, you know, worked on, but if you can show, the, inflammation is harm. When we talk about feeling sick, feeling unwell, like before an infection or or in a high period of stress, you know, through some, you know, personal tragedy or something like that, what we are describing is inflammation. Sure. It's not just associated. When you're feeling unwell, what you are describing is that you have high inflammatory markers. Yeah. So if social media is causing inflammatory markers at levels comparable to cancer, to heart disease, or to diabetes, or to mental health problems, wow. then it is harming you physically, literally, not metaphorically. It is yeah. causing you physical, is it causing your body to be harmed and basically pushed closer to death. It's pretty scary. So it's, you know, it's not like a theoretical construct. It, if, yeah. if that turns out to be the case, yeah. um, or to the degree to which it turns out to be the case, yeah. and if it exacerbates it because you have inflammation, you seek out social media, which is making it worse, yeah. then I, I think it's, you know, society will, will demand yeah. th that legislation. And they need to. Legislation. You've got no choice. And what's interesting is this isn't a conversation in the, in the pub with someone that isn't, you know, informed. You're professor, you're a doctor, you, you're around all this stuff. So that's what really hits home for me is you, 
as you say, it's not proven yet, but as far as you're concerned, if you were asked, you know, is there an absolute, is it absolutely a direct correlation? 100%. That is pretty I, scary. I, I think it would, it would take yeah. a lot of imagination to argue that it's not the case. Scary time. Yeah. You, your eyes lit up when you talked about your, your, your students and uh, that there's a sense of camaraderie and connectivity there, which yeah. is also a mental thing. You know, I think I've been learning a lot more about how important connectivity is and so on rather than being on your own and not communicating and not learning. Do you, do you really enjoy that nurturing side of things and, and that sense of community where you're all learning off each other? And did you get brought up around that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I really do. Mm. Um, a lot of the time in universities, people sort of think about teaching as kind of a nuisance because it takes you away from research, takes yeah. you away from all the, the posture things um, that promote a career. But um, my dad, has, who is a professor, has this analogy that teaching and research are like the... Um, the hull and the and the mast of a ship. Mm -hmm. You want to put all the sails up because you go faster. That's sure. research. But if you don't have a deep hull, the boat capsizes or it's yeah. Got to be in harnessing and in tandem. You yeah. need both. You need a balance. Yeah. So the teaching, I find it. Um, I mean, it's you know, I, I, I live for for it for the interactions and um, to some extent, it's a selfish sentiment, right? Because I get to feel like I'm helping. So I mean, yeah. I, I'm no saint, you know. Um, but. But yeah, I, th I think that is really helps to propel you. Mm. At the end of the day, all the papers and all the, you know, research and stuff. Mm. You know, it's, of course, it's very important for humanity. But it's you know, it's hard to. It's not going to keep you warm at night, essentially. But um, but the interactions with um, with colleagues, with students, um, with mm. the public, actually. Yeah. Um, when I was in Australia, I was doing some some stuff with high schools, teaching about science careers and stuff, and that that's amazing. Yeah. Um, and like you, I'm a dad, so um, having to teach my my three-year-old, um, yeah. you know, why is the sky blue? It's like, oh, that's a very good question. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so that that kind of obviously that provides a lot of energy yeah. too. Yeah. And actually, just in context of talking to you now, listening to that, there's there's an element of um, success around what you're doing and what can happen with some of these trials and so on. But along the way, none more so probably than in your profession to achieve any success, you have to fail like regularly. Yeah. And I think whether that's from a business mindset, from an athlete's point of view, a lot of people are, you know, have this fear of failure. Mm. You clearly can't have that in context of what you do because you've got to keep trying different things to eliminate, 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 which actually, you know, they become obstacles rather than failure yeah. to seek the success. Is that, is that a mindset you've always had because of how you've been a doctor, a professor and in that, in that space? It's very wise of you to put it that way. And I think that's mm. probably wiser than most scientists would put it, um, that it's kind of our job to fail. Yeah. Um, the best you can do to try to figure out how nature works is to try things that don't work, to mm. try something else. You're sort of partitioning this gesture that you made with your hands. You partition the space, um, carve out the bits yeah. that don't work. Um, so it's kind of our job to fail, um, which is reassuring because if you fail, you're like, literally, I'm doing my job. Yeah. Um, and you're narrowing your... You're narrowing mm. towards, towards a theory of, you know, how it actually works. Unfortunately, we are human. I mean, not unfortunately, but you know, uh, being what we are, um, yeah. it's hard to sustain, you know, failing all the time. And the way grants work and the way research progress uh, in practice works and, you know, promotions and stuff is you need some successes, yeah. you know, because we don't promote people fail all the time, even though everybody understands that that's how science is supposed to work. So you need to find sort of a balance. But uh, typically people don't report their failures because um, it doesn't sound very good. No. But it's actually those that I teach you most about nature. Um, and medicine and, and engineering and so on. Um, so um, in respect of whether it's something that I feel like I am a little bit more comfortable with it than some of my colleagues. I don't really know what, where, I, where I sit. I don't particularly no. see it as a bad thing if I, if I try something. And I've tried loads of stuff that hasn't worked. So yeah. yeah um, and it might be slightly different in your personal life because the human element comes into it. And that's where we have to override that mindset. Whereas when you're in the trenches in the professor mindset it's yeah. is this going to work boom didn't work it's out of your mind there's no emotion didn't work why didn't it work da, da, da. Well, personally surprised... it might be slightly different so of course personally it's different but even even professionally um you become quite attached to your theory um i mean people lose yeah, sleep I over it. I, I lose sleep over it I, yeah sure um i, I this this uh, cancer thing that we're talking about this grant that, that we're, i'm putting in with some some colleagues from here and from sure. from Europe, you know, there's a lot of emotional energy that's gone Reputational into reputational side of things as well to some extent. Yeah, yeah, of Which course. Creates the yeah. Of course, yeah. Particularly as you get to sort of like the middle of your career, where yeah. you can't quite 
you know, it's harder to fail because you sort of have more responsibilities. Yeah, I get that. And you're not I'm a dad now. And all, yeah, 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 yeah. There, there are things. Yeah. Um, so no, no, people become very um, attached and you'd be surprised some of the feuds and science between scientists of competing theories and a lot of it's emotional. Okay. Because they should be, you know, whatever the truth is, they should be yeah. totally chilled out about it, but it's not really what happens. So you become, people become very, very attached to their ideas. Yeah. And indeed, I think it's necessary to do that in order to sustain yourself because it's a hard career. Yeah. Um, especially if it's a if it's medical research, so you know if you're if you're a doctor and a scientist, yeah. um, it's the only way you could sustain that level of energy and effort for decades on end yeah. is by being emotionally involved, much as much as personally. Yeah. Um, so to some extent, it's kind of reassuring that people love their theories. No, I get that. Uh, but at the same yeah. time, you know, love you know. Yeah, the it's the, sword. Yeah, the behavior that comes afterwards, and I think one thing that I feel sets you apart, and and very much is. Your, your mindset and the, your approach to literally what you're doing with your, your approach to curing cancer. You touched on the whole um, organized crime, make them feel part of the community. So every form of um, preventative and cure has been to attack. Yeah. And, you know, chemo, of course, you know, you get carpet bombing and everything's attack, attack, attack. Yeah. And yet, where did that mindset come from to actually look to nurture? Because you, you related that to community. So that's kind of almost a human element, but you know, from a scientist's point of view, I guess everyone's looked to right. We need to eliminate. We need to carpet bomb. Yeah. How did how did that come in? Was there a moment, why, where was the sort of thought process that came through that you then linked that to cancer? I, so I'm, I'm not a historian of science. My understanding is that basically around about the time that we started to understand about genes and, and genetic makeup and and, and stuff is really mm. when people um, started thinking of it. Possibly it's a viewpoint coming from the military where you know a lot of the research was done around about the yeah. time of, of both world wars and people started thinking that when we talk about cancer treatments we almost always talk about targets mm -hmm. people say oh i found a new target and i'm going to start a new startup company that's going to target that that cell or, or whatever and there's certainly a role for that and mm -hmm. we have made um progress in cancers for example in pediatric cancers mm -hmm. a lot um but overall um it, it doesn't seem like it's the right metaphor right. and that we really should be thinking of it as something that has kind of gone wrong in how the cells are supposed to cooperate and work together. Yeah. And a few of them feel like they need to go off and attack. And the more that the immune system attacks and then the oncologist attacks, the more it's a cornered, circle. It's a vicious circle, the more right. cornered they feel, the yeah. more it escalates. And at the end, the result is metastatic disease and, and death. So, um, so there's certainly room for some new ideas. Um, mm. What we are doing, for example, this we're calling it onco espionage. You know, I want to put a little chip in your tumor and just like listen to what they're saying. You know, yeah. a lot of the way we win wars, including against the mafia, is through espionage rather yeah. than than guns. Yeah, infiltrate, um, understand, get the intel, do something. Yeah, yeah, That's block their comms. But that wasn't being done. It hasn't been done in any way really until you understood that mindset and went in because everything uh, as far else as I know we're the first. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's groundbreaking. It's um, awesome. We'll see how it's like, humbling to be talking to you on that basis because it's a it's a you know it's a huge killer. Anyone watching this um, or listening to it is likely to know someone or have been around someone that it's taken lives from. So if you can, yeah, if you can in any way, yeah, eliminate the, the killer, that's going to be yeah. Enormous. Start to start to think of it. I mean, there's a colleague of mine who said this. So I'm borrowing a, a line, but um, instead of thinking sort of oh, what we do with organized crime, we, we can't completely eliminate it, right? We'll never eliminate crime from society. But we turn it into a low-grade chronic problem. Mm. We turn it into something that, you know, we interact with sometimes. We kind of do a bit of prevention, a bit of policing, yeah. a bit of kind of, you know, removing the incentives mm -hmm. to like defecting from society and becoming a criminal. We do all of those things and that's how we kind of keep crime from dominating society and, you know, destroying yeah. communities, right? And so the yeah. hope is that that's what we'll be able to eventually do with cancer. It will never go away because it's the price of multicellularity. It's the price of the rich lives that we have where we're sitting here yeah. having an interview with, you know, like cameras and computers and stuff. The cost is, is, is that when you have a society and a community, things sometimes do go wrong. Sure. But the hope is that we can turn it into something that we can live with. It will not kill us. We can no. coexist with in some in some form. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, love, I love it. Um, yeah. At the heart of this as well, and sort of at the beginning of all this, is education. Now, if there's anyone watching, listening to this that uh, knows what you're doing, aspires to want to make a difference, what advice would you give them starting out? So that's just sort of coming through maybe teenage years. Mm -hmm. you know, what advice would you give them? Because you've got, you've got perspective now. You're looking back, you can see where you've made a difference, where some of the people that you are working with make a difference. And you can give some advice potentially early in the career because mm. there's so many things you don't learn in school that you are learning now that are not part of the academic curriculum 
Yeah, um, I'm not sure I'm qualified to to, to give it. I'm not asking you from a qualification. I'm asking you from a Dan's point of view. Um, um, you're you're a, you're a dad now. Of course, your son's going to learn. Yeah, through just being around you. So, but you know what I mean by that. I'm, my question's aimed at the fact that algebra, the Bunsen burner, yeah. the cl- the classic kind of cliche upbringing. There's so much more to be able to open up people's eyes to how they could potentially look at this. Of course, to oh, go yes. the, the the professor route, it's qualifications and so on. But there's other people that may not choose to go that way, may not be in- intelligent enough, but just all being able to make a difference. I'm sure that they're intelligent enough. I mean, intelligence is not, not the barrier to becoming a scientist. Um, yeah, no, so now that I understand your question a little better, um, there's a lot of pressure to commit early in yeah. your career, right? So you, you so I, did, I did mathematics for my undergrad, um, and then people are like, okay, Rosa, you need to become a mathematician. Mm. I was like, let's do some engineering first, you know? And, and you always, people always trying to like, kind of channel you into you know growing up quickly and stuff and yeah. be, you know there are a lot of avenues now you can you can join a startup you can work in in biotech firms you can stay in universities you can do all I've done all of the above um, and it, it seems not to have harmed me um, so I think just staying curious and not not letting the voices around you that including your your parents who are just want you to have a nice stable life of course they've got you back not always the best advice though, yeah, well, they, like generals they're always fighting the last war Interesting. Right. Yeah. So um, I think, yeah, just th- my one piece of advice from Dan would be to just stay. That's what I say to all my st- students. Um, just stay curious. Don't think you've got time. Think about what you want to do. Really mm. find your passion. Because if you don't find it and most people don't. Yeah. Um, it's very hard to, to sustain a, a happy, you know, what the Greeks called eudaimonia, you know, like a purposeful, meaningful mm. life. Okay. Happiness through purpose. It's very difficult to do that if you don't, if you're not passionate about what you're doing. Yeah. So, so that means the corollary of that is that as long as it takes to find your passion, that's how long as it, however long that takes, that's that's, that, that's the time, you know. That's brilliant. Yeah, um, I get that. And, and the passion is absolutely you know, yeah. evident with you. And of course, what what a legacy, what a what a achievement that would be. And I'm interested to know that you know is there is there an achievement that you're particularly proud of at this stage of your life, and how important is legacy to you? I mean, I think legacy is almost everything. I struggle to think of any any degree of success that doesn't involve um, legacy. I, I think I've learned, um, possibly starting from quite low level, to have more compassion and more love, basically. Mm. I've come to think what we need for most of the world's problems, including medical problems, is more love, yeah. more understanding. I've gotten better at that. It's a work in progress, uh, I can assure you. But um, but if there is an accomplishment, it's that I've become less judgmental and yeah. and, and able to some extent to, to be more more compassionate. And I look forward to, to, to the rest of the journey and to imparting that, mm. for example, on, um, on my son, but also, of course, on my students. Um, yeah, yeah that, if there's one thing I would say is it's, it's, it's l- learning, yeah, to try to be more loving, more, That's great. more compassionate. Yeah. And in context of um, these trials in Harvard, there's, there's an impatient part to me in anything I'm doing. So I'm, I'm listening to you thinking this is all incredibly, mm. potentially groundbreaking, exciting. Is there any kind of timeline on this? I mean, I use that example of failure and narrowing it down, but do you have any kind of idea or, or um, I don't use the word targets because what you said, but in terms <laughs> of goals, so yeah. what, is there a moment where you'll start to think, gosh, this is, this is actually looking like it's, you know, absolutely going to be working and so on. And how long might that take? So this, the cycle in, in medical research is long because mm. we have to balance safety with innovation. And, you know, mm. if you think about things like thalidomide, for example, we would obviously never want anything like that to happen ever again. No. So um, there is a balance. You have to um, try to go as fast as you can, and but it also has to be balanced with making. So you start in mice, you know, yeah. um, and you move on to you know, eventually do it in humans. Um, so um, it isn't quick. But the good news is that it's getting quicker. Yeah. Um, things like AI, um, a lot of the biotech techniques and lab techniques we have now are making things go a lot yeah. faster. Um, so um, I would I would be disappointed if in half a decade to a decade from now, we don't have some solid evidence that we can deal with a large body of, um, of tumors, uh, a diverse body of tumors by using some of these ideas yeah. about listening. Is there a basic language? Can we interfere with their communications? Can mm-hmm. we remove some of the incentives for being invasive or being aggressive? Mm-hmm. Um, can we do something other than carpet bomb, you know, incessantly? Um, I would be disappointed if in five years from now, um, there isn't, you know, a concrete 
thing there. And if in 10 years from now, it's not, you know, being used widely in, in the clinic. So, wrong, right? which I mean, is, on which, the basis of the last, say, 100 years and how much, yes. you know, um, we've, we've, we've improved and saved people's lives, it's nothing. So that's actually really encouraging. That's exciting. I'm glad to hear you say that. <laughs> so I thought you might be disappointed by that. Oh, well, <laughs> from an impatient point of view, there's people that could be watching this now and they, 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 that's the sad thing, they, they need it now. But as long as it's coming, as long as it's pointing in the right direction and, you know, you're, I feel guilty taking your time and sitting with you talking now because it's just amazing what you're doing. But there's a huge amount of work going into cancer worldwide with a massive amounts of funding. Um, we're very good at it here in Britain. They're very good in the U.S. There are other places um, around the world, and I think we can hope that within this century, yeah. next 20, 30 years, that it'll be cured in between inverted commas. I mean, we'll never completely get rid of it because like the community, things will always go wrong. Yeah. Um, but that we'll be able to approach a level where we start to think of it sort of how we think about diabetes now, like yeah. something you have to live with and something that you might die with, but mm. not of. I get that, you managing know? it. Yeah, yeah. You know, just something oh, manageable. Right. I think that's the hope for the next 20, 30 years yeah. within our, yeah. all our careers. Yeah. I've learned so much talking Likewise. to you. I've been studying for it and you flew in especially, yeah. you're, you're an extraordinary, extraordinary person. So thank you so much for coming to talk to me. I really appreciate <laughs> the it. The pleasure was mine, I'm sure. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.